Hello, everybody, and welcome to Mind Science TV. Now, I'm Richard Hill from the Mind Science Institute, and these programs are designed to bring you interviews, really conversations, uh, with the interesting, the expert, the experienced, and I've got a really, really interesting fellow to talk to today. Evan Katz uh, is here. Uh, hi, Evan. How are you? To, the, well, this morning for me, this afternoon for you in the, the USA. Hi, Richard. Thanks for... Doing? I'm doing great. How's things down under? Well, I'm I'm up and at I'm, I'm up and at I'm impressed the fact that we've both put on jackets. You know. Yes. We're, we're kind of in we're uniform. Looking <laughs> we're looking good. But let me talk a bit about you, Evan. You'll have to sit there and uh, and and look uh, look humble. Okay. But, uh, Evan is um, he's actually known around the profession as the anger guy. And because he works with anger, he works with men uh, and and boys with anger and anger issues. And what's really what I was drawn to Evan for was because uh, he actually used to be the angry guy, and that was a uh, uh, that was a, a little moniker he didn't like. But he took himself out of that, took himself out of being an angry guy, and he'll tell us a bit of the story in a minute, which is you know really heart wrenching. Uh, and then started to work and started to study and started to think. Uh, he's now uh, a licensed counselor. He also works with uh, addiction issues. And he's been doing this for the last uh, 15 years or so, uh, just helping men understand anger. And there are a few other, few other bits and bumps in Evan's story which he'll tell us as we go along. Uh, so this is a man who's lived it, learned it, and has come back to relive it, but from a positive side. I don't know when you, you saw the episode with uh, Bonnie Badenoch. You should go back. She deals with trauma, which she too had a lot of trauma. They really know these people. They really know, and this is one guy who does. So, Evan, let's turn to you because okay. that's enough of me chatting. Uh, I've 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 hinted to them that you have this 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 wonderful story, and every story should be written down and it should be presented both audio, visually, and written. And guess what? you have written a book and this is what caught my eye and drew you to because the Mind Science Institute, what better than your book? I, you've got one. Do you want to just, you. just show sure, it? Sure, sure, sure. It's called Inside the Mind of an Angry Man. Uh, uh, so cool. Perfect. Yes, yeah. yes, because a lot of times we know their behaviors, but we don't know why. We don't know what it is they're doing and why they're doing it. And uh, until we get to the causal factors, we're not going to be able to make a difference. So that's the way I see it. Yeah, that's cool. That that's great. Simple cover. Uh, yes. Just that wonderful image of the man walking towards the light uh, from, but just in. He's just a silhouette. Uh, he's a silhouette. I, I, I really, he's alone. Yeah. He's alone, and uh, that's a big part of uh, angry men is feeling very alone, even though um, they act like they're not. And the black and the white actually symbolize the all or nothing attitude of angry men. Uh, it's either uh, zero or a hundred. It's either this way or that way, but uh, to leave them in the gray is not something that uh, they really want to do. So uh, to me, when I put it together, that's why it symbolizes a lot. And then, you know, as we talked about on the back, are some questions people can ask themselves uh, or somebody else about if they know an angry guy. And, huh, you know, yeah, that's, that's, if it's helpful, that's what's yeah, important. Those questions. Yeah, just uh, uh, do that a bit more because they're, they're neat. It's just a little little checklist. Sure. Uh, and I think and you only two or three of them need to, if you answer yes to two or three of them, you need to pay that's attention. Right. Just, just give a quick run through of, uh, of those questions. Sure. I ask uh, eight questions that I've learned over, over many years uh, that really tell me if somebody's running into trouble. Uh, the first one, has it ever been suggested that you might have a problem with anger? So has anybody ever said to you, hey, you might have an anger problem, and you say, no, I don't have a problem. Uh, another one is, do you, do you sometimes wonder why you get so angry and so often? Because people with anger problems have what we call a pervasive pattern of getting angry, and there's always a reason for it. Um, do you stay angry or bitter at people who treated you unjustly? Uh, or unfairly, and typically we we call this a resentment, right? Uh, it's when you you 
you keep things in your head rent free. You know, it's uh, they really didn't earn their way up there, but they stay. Um, another one would be uh, uh, Aryan, and, and they take residence. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. I tell the guy, don't let anybody in your head rent free. Everybody's got to pay to get in there. So uh, uh, another question would be, uh, are you often intolerant or impatient with yourself or others? Uh, we'll find that one of the chief characteristics of angry men is a need to be perfect, and we all know that perfectionists are the only ones who always fail. And uh, they are extremely critical of themselves, and that's why we see a lot of uh, criticism of others. They project it and so forth. Um, have you been told repeatedly that you have an excessive need to be right? Uh, this is a very telltale sign of an angry guy. Uh, I ask the people all the time, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? Pick one. Because sometimes, unfortunately, the happiest an angry man will get is to be right. And it's really sad. So that's something we look at. Um, do you feel more often than not that you don't receive the respect you deserve? It's not that they don't, but that's how they perceive it. And another question uh, would be, do you, do you have difficulty trusting and letting go, uh, letting others get close to you? Uh, there's a lot behind that. Maybe we talk about why that happens. And finally, does it feel like most of your intentions are are misinterpreted or misunderstood. Uh, most most angry men uh, don't see themselves the way the rest of the world sees them. They they uh, uh, see people backing off or being uh, uh, you know put off or insulted by something they say, and they're like, oh, ah, ah, but that's not what I meant. Uh, but unfortunately, they're the ones in the minority because everyone else saw it the same way as the person who was insulted. So um, these are these are eight questions that I recommend that people ask themselves, or if you know someone who's an angry man, uh, ask yourself about them. And if, if they answer yes to two of them, uh, and they're pretty solid with that, there's probably something going on. If there's three, uh, they they've probably got an anger problem, and you probably already knew it, but this gave you confirmation. Yeah, and I think this is exactly what people need. This is why I like the book because it, it's uh, uh, certainly uh, the therapists uh, should read it, should have a look. I mean, it's similar to the way I, uh, I wrote my book. We're talking about that sort of thing, something for the therapist, but it's something the therapist can share with the client. Yes. They're great. That's a great list. Thanks. Uh, I mean, if this were the if this were the neuroscience show, which which we're not going to do so much now, there's going to be more of an experiential one. I could talk for an hour on each thing. There's there's, mm. there's great neuroscience uh, backing. It's fascinating. Because one yeah. of the things which is, yeah, well, one of the things that's really frustrating about uh, and difficult um, about a lot of modern behavior, a lot of modern cultural stuff, is anger isn't a stupid emotion. It is. Mm. It isn't a, a, a useless emotion. And when we used to live, we used to have saber-toothed tigers jumping out that's from right. behind rocks and things. It, it was very handy. Certainly. But um. Without anger, with, without anger, we we wouldn't survive as a race. I mean, uh, anger is our our shield to uh, instinctive fear. A lot of in, intuitive instinctive fear. All of the uh, animal kingdom have it. Uh, we call it in the, the reptilian part of the brain, right? And it's the uh, the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems that the fight or flight, if you will. And if we didn't have that, we couldn't survive as as a race. There would be there would be no as a species, there's there's no way that we would be able to do that. So, it's the problem is in the the front of the brain with the humans who have the ability to reason, uh, the filtering going out and the experiences and the filtering going back in, and the perceptions become altered or distorted, and they're not what uh, uh, they were intended to be. Yeah, I mean it's really interesting when you're saying you, know, you have mentioned a bit of neuroscience, which is great. That the frontal part, the, the the frontal lobes, that's sort of the the executive organizing area. And they're the areas also that interrupt these emotional uh, mm. outbursts that we uh, from the limbic system. But what's really interesting is that when they do uh, uh, fMRIs of people having anger things and whatever, the, the, uh, how, how on earth you get someone angry while they're lying down in one of those machines, I'm not sure how they do that. <laughs> but uh, it's an area called the orbital frontal cortex, mm. which is sort of this area sort of underneath the eyes here. And one of the things that that does is it's an error detection area of the Interesting. Brain. So it's this, it's sort of sitting there going, this doesn't seem right. This 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 isn't this isn't good. And that 
uh, error detection is directly related to the emotional areas, saying, you know, have a feeling about this. Mm -hmm. And that eight list there, a lot of them are about, this isn't right, I'm, this isn't fair, this isn't good, this isn't appropriate, I need to take an action. Right. Uh, and, uh, I mean, the big story about why anger is so huge in our culture, you know, we, we may not, we haven't got time for now. Let's just talk about anger itself, okay. though. Um, because it expresses itself in different ways. Like, not everybody just uh, jumps up and yells and screams, oh. that's anger and that's it. Oh, just one quick one. I was going to say, the hot, one of the big uh, evolutionary things with anger is that uh, when you're facing death, you know, you're fighting the, the saber-toothed tiger and uh, you think, oh, well, I'm, I'm probably going to die if I don't do something crazy. Anger is the thing that makes you lose all sense all good ideas, and you just lash out like a crazy man because it's do or die. That's right. It's a survival yeah. mechanism. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and and whether whether you know whether whether you've been treated properly at work, I know it's a hassle, but it ain't do or die. Yes. Yes. And you know uh, when you you mentioned uh, this doesn't feel right. Something's wrong with this picture. It's an interesting concept because for the human being. Uh, being uh, really even with animals, uh, being conditioned in a certain environment uh, can twist and play with those intuitive thoughts. So uh, if someone believes that as a little kid growing up uh, that to uh, have have a lot of criticism and yelling and uh, a lot of demeaning uh, uh, behavior that that makes them you know that's their identity that's what's supposed to happen when they go into an environment where they're treated uh, lovingly or uh, in a softer way it makes them very nervous because that part of the brain then says hmm something's wrong here this isn't right and it's based on that distorted perception now you're not talking about this from uh, uh, reading books no uh, uh, this 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 is a little closer to your home. Do, do yes. you mind just sharing some? I don't want to. Sure. I know you're very open with your private life, but uh, this is uh, this is a very touching uh, experience. Share us a bit. Sure. Well, uh, I wrote this book as a result of uh, uh, some some changes in my life that that really spurred on. Um, uh, the, the need to give more back to the world and to my profession. And uh, essentially what happened in my life is I grew up with a very angry, uh, alcoholic father. And he uh, used me basically as his, his emotional punching bag. I came to believe in my life that I was fortunate to be tolerated. And this is what was confirmed over and over again to me. Uh, or that was my perception. There was tremendous criticism of myself, which made me critical of myself. Um, there, there was uh, a lot of putting down, and even when I did well, uh, exploitation or mocking what I'm doing. It was like nothing was ever good enough. And for a young man uh, needing his father's validation, if you can't get it, it's not his fault. It must be my fault. So this is how I grew up. So by the time I was into school and getting some public activity, I felt less than going in right away because my opinion of myself was uh, created uh, in an environment where that's what I thought it was, that I was less than. So that's what I took out into the world. And as a result, I had uh, a lot of insecurity. And I learned how to cope. And the way you learn how to cope uh, with anger that I've learned over many years is uh, you compensate. Uh, if the, the lower that I felt, if this was the middle, the lower that I felt, uh, if I need to really cope in a situation, the more I'll act uh, real secure. If I feel insecure, I'll act overly secure. If I feel power, powerless, which was very often, then I will act powerful as if nothing bothers me. And the big one is control. If I felt out of control, which I never felt any sense of control, and I didn't have it growing up, uh, then I become controlling in my environments in order to cope. Because oh, where everyone so else is... Yeah. So I'll just jump in there because that's really good. Uh -huh. Because anger achieves so many of those things. You yes. yell at people. You start doing this. You start looking dangerous. They back off. And That's in right. fact, there's a very interesting uh, paper just uh, uh, just recently, or just for, for those practitioners out there, uh, this lovely little thing. We always grab something, but um, 
this is uh, 2012 from the uh, National uh, uh, Mental Health Institute, National Institute of Mental Health, just yes. talking about the cognitive nature of, of, of anger. But it's, it's a very effective way of making people back off, uh, that, that sort of intimidatory nature. So you get power, you get control, uh, you get um, uh, what seems to be respect. Uh, what seems to be, things, right. Exactly as you said, beautifully said, that when you, when you don't have it, you use this simple mechanism of anger and bingo, you get it all. And in fact, That's there's right. one lovely comment, then I'll, I want you to go on, but one lovely comment that avoidance of anger is, a mechani is one of the ways in which society stays civil, that we mm. actually stay nice because we don't want to get yelled at. Mm. But in your story, not getting yelled at uh, didn't do that. It actually, you know, you just went the opposite because it gave me anxiety. Angry. It, it gave me anxiety not to be yelled at. Um, <clears throat> that that's what formed my identity as a human being was that I uh, was less than. It just was the way it was, and. My job looking out going into the world was uh, to make sure that that was not taken advantage of and that others didn't see it. So my perception from the beginning as a, as a, as a human being, uh, today I know that I'm no better and I'm no less than anyone else. But at that time, uh, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that I was less. So I went into the world. The world was a dangerous place, and I was defensive from the beginning. Uh, be, because I was worried that I was going to get hurt, and the the tools I used to uh, to keep people off were the ones I was taught by my father. So you you, you had a you had a really this kicked you in the head in a way that I don't think uh, I don't think anybody believe in be able to a lot of people out there will find and particularly. Uh, you know, I know we have a lot of women listening in, and and I know that very much, ladies uh, out there, that we're we're talking about men. Uh, we'll have to go find a, a fabulous person to talk about women's anger. I'm not quite sure myself, but that's another story. But you had you had a, a confrontation with your father that um, yes that that actually rocked your life. Yes, uh, several years later after. <clears throat> uh, punching walls or punching holes in walls as an adolescent and and uh, uh, drinking and and losing friends and losing family and and ostracizing myself from society uh, I got older my father uh, went traveling and around the country and kind of I was older now so I was able to stay away from him uh, but there would be uh, contact intermittently and uh, he went into the hospital at one point after I was already uh, married and had a little girl and uh, he had had a, a severe heart attack and my brother and I were called uh, at that time they didn't know if he was going to survive he was, he was only 56 and uh, uh, we arrived and uh, uh, you know, he's in pretty bad shape, but they they uh, put a stent in his in the heart area, and they said he was going to be great. And he woke up and he seemed fine. So my brother and I are like, great. Well, it was the night before Thanksgiving, and we said, well, let's pack up and go, because we weren't going to stay with our father. Um, so uh, my brother packed his things. His flight was a little earlier, and mine was uh, the next morning. And about uh, well. When I was to back up a little bit, uh, during that afternoon I had come back and he was actually sitting up eating. And uh, just like clockwork, like uh, the old days, as much as I had done coming down there, uh, uh, staying up all night, taking care of the things a first son is supposed to do and so forth, he, he said something very, very slashing towards me. And it was very similar to what had happened years earlier. And by now, though, I had become an angry guy. I had become just about as fit as him in terms of being a real jerk and having a very, very sharp tongue and uh, very little sensitivity to other people and oversensitivity to how people treated me. So uh, I shot back at him, and we went to it, and it was for the first time. It was, uh, uh, you know, like the two two stars with uh, it was like Darth Vader and uh, uh, his – his protege uh, going at it uh, right there in the ICU, 
and unfortunately, uh, I didn't seem to care at the time as the ICU, but nonetheless, uh, a nursing staff eventually pushed me out of the ICU. I said something to him that really rocked his boat, and uh, he, I knew that I got him. So when I left the ICU, I was very proud of myself. I had stood up to my father. I had uh, hit him with the best stuff I could emotionally, verbally, and I walked out pretty, pretty happy. So I went back to the hotel, went to sleep. I got a call about 4.30 in the morning from the hospital staff. They say, hey, you've got to get down here. He's still angry at you. And we've got him in four-point restraints, and he's going he's gonna to pop that stent this hard if he doesn't calm down. So just come down here and do whatever you have to do. So I got up and was upset. I'm like, he's going to win again. And I went down, and about 4.30 in the morning, 5 o'clock, I got there, and everything changed at that moment. I walked into the ICU. There was no one there anymore. Uh, he was there. He was laying very still. Uh, restraints were still on him. And I walked up, and uh, my father was dead. And, uh, you know, I was a catalyst to that. I, the argument we had is what stirred him to his level of anger that he stayed with that eventually popped the stent in his heart, and he bled to death. So that was a very <clears throat> interesting, in some ways interesting. It was a very difficult feeling, but not right away it wasn't difficult. Uh, my defenses were still up very high. But for the next several years, it, things were very, very difficult for me. I basically spent the next several years uh, punishing myself, believing that my father was right about me. Uh, obviously, I you know, participated in killing him. So everything he said about me must be true. And now I've, I've taken down the only person who really knew me. This is how I, I saw it. And that punishment on myself came out on other people. So life was tough for quite some time. But it wasn't you, of course. You, you, you learned that. It, it was anger. It was this irrational um, yes. fighting mm -hmm. of, of life. Uh, because you certainly as hell, uh, you're sure as hell not enjoying yourself while you're angry, even though you're getting some kind no. of subversive pleasures. Uh, as I say, you, you, know, you feel powerful, you feel in control. And um, I, I, I just like to, to take away the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the individuals uh, out of the story and just say, you know, it was anger that killed him. Uh, Absolutely. But it took me many years to let go of my own until I was able to see that it was his that killed him. Because one of the telltale signs of someone who's angry is they blame everybody else for their problems. I mean, if they took responsibility for their own problems, then who would they have to be angry at? So it's more about, you know, I need the world, people, places, and things to change because I don't want to or I don't know how. So until I was able to really wrestle with my own anger and, and uh, accept some things about myself, which ironically was to accept that I was a good guy, uh, I wasn't able to see exactly what you said, that I didn't, I didn't kill my father. And uh, my father chose to stay angry after we had an argument. It is really that simple. And that's something that, you know, anyone could do. It was a choice to a large extent. And uh, that's the way he had lived, and that's what he had done. And, in fact, his heart attack may have very well been as a result of living a life of anger. I, we know that uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, blood pressure, uh, strokes, many, many very serious uh, uh, ailments, cancer, uh, has been shown in studies to be caused by the effects of anger, by the, the, the torque that it puts on the human body. And, uh, you know, it's a tremendous stressor. Angry guys get very tired by the end of the day because controlling everything in your day, people, places, and things, takes a lot of effort. <laughs> so uh, that's what happened. And until I started to change, I wasn't able to... Uh, recognize uh, the objectivity. I was like him. So when I began to change, uh, life really began to change. And moving it forward now, so this is the thing you realize mm -hmm. I had to change. This is what you do now with uh, with yes. people, uh, individuals, with groups. Let's just move forward now from the from the the, the learning ground, <laughs> sort of the talk about, stuff, you know, yeah. tough learning ground. 
uh, what's some of the things when you when you work with people? What do you find? Where, where do you go first? Uh, is there a typical place you go first? Do you fish around a little bit? What are the sort of the just give us a little bit now of the this the positive side. The now we want to hear a bit. We heard from the angry guy. I want to let's hear a bit more now from the anger guy who uh, who really helps. What what do you do when you're working with people? Well. <clears throat> much of what I do with them is as a result of living it as well. I combine uh, clinical experience and uh, my knowledge with the, my master's degree and, and um, expertise in, in my field, particularly working with men, in <clears throat> being able to observe and then uh, uh, point out to them at, at, at certain points what I see happening. And that usually wouldn't occur in a counseling session. For example, uh, I was working with a gentleman who um, uh, has a family of four, and his uh, wife uh, is is pretty, uh, he described it as pushy, and, and she was a very uh, strong personality. And he would allow this to happen a lot and, and kind of not wanted to deal with the conflict in a healthy way with her. So he would let this happen a lot, but at the same time he was building up a lot of resentment. So he would blow up, uh, you know, very unreasonably and in ways that simply aren't okay in front of his children to his wife, and it became more often his way of getting out resentment was to, to take on control, to, to uh, uh, make everyone remember that he's in the house. So. Uh, when he got to me, as a result of his marriage just about cracking up, he would tell me this story. And my first question to him was, well, well why did you confront her early on when things were, you know, uh, uh, starting to bother you? And, and he would say, well, you know, uh, I didn't know what to do. I said, well, maybe that's part of the problem. You know, if you didn't know what to do, that's not her fault. And uh, we would talk about uh, the idea of doing really well in the world outside of uh, the family, where most of the men that I work with are very high performance. In other words, they, they do better than average in their work environment, many self-employed sales, people working pretty much in their own zone. But their lives at home are falling apart because they're very good at performance, as I was taught. It's what you do, it's not who you are that makes you okay. And so what do you learn? You're not an idiot, you say, okay, learn something that you can do well. But relationships, of course, are all about uh, who you are. And what you do becomes very secondary, and that becomes very scary. So when I ask them and we talk about this, say, so, you know, it sounds like you're a lot more confident in your work environment than you are at home. So, well, yeah, sure. So yeah, well, what's that about? And we find, and I, you know, try to uh, help them with the words that the work environment is very measurable. It's very quantitative, where the relationships and the family environment is qualitative and it's fluid, and they can't measure it. So uh, when I point these things out, they they tend to get it, and if they get feisty, which is often in the beginning, I remind them that uh, their thinking, which they rely on because they don't go to the feeling, uh, their thinking, their efforts, everything they're trying to tell me sitting there about how everybody else did it, actually landed them flat on the rear end on my couch. And I remind them of that, that they're the ones sitting here and that other people don't seem to have the problem. So there, there are ways you can confront someone who's angry more than you can confront somebody who doesn't because they, they've got a toughness about them, and they, in fact, respect that. They tell me all the time, I'm glad somebody, you know, was able to say the truth. So they're really asking for it. And, and it seems that, you know, I mean, if we, if we train little boys to be tough, strong individuals that win all the time, and uh, just talk about their successes and hide their failures or the things that, that don't go so well, kind of what do we expect? So, so That's right. a lot of what you do is re retraining them how to access their vulnerability, their, their humanity, their, uh, their ups and downs, and that's okay. That's the sort of thing that you, you work with them, I, I'm hearing. 
Well, I do, but it's very deep-seated because, like myself, most of them grew up in an environment from, from the get-go uh, when they're learning and developing who they are in relation to the rest of the world. Uh, they were never really given the sense that who they are is more important than what they do. So it's hard to, it's really not even retraining, it's training for the first time to have a different perspective of who you are. And it's a very scary thing to do because remember that at some level, when they were a child and the natural tendency to be who you are, uh, they were emotionally whacked just like I was, and we learn not to trust our intuition, and we learn not to trust what, what seems natural or what other people would, would do. We learn to be on guard because we know what's going to happen, because we know that we're less than, and that that's just the way it has to be. And that's kind of how an angry guy lives. That's why he's so vigilant, and he can go into a room and knows exactly where he should stand and what he's supposed to do. Um, it's really sad. It's really sad. And one, one of the things that I do mention to the guys, I, if, the, if the time is right, and I, I firmly believe this, I tell them when, when I see when this gentleman that we, we were talking about here about blowing up, I, I said to him, you know, when I hear about somebody that's as angry as you're describing and uh, who's got that much inside, I know that Anger is what comes out, but what I'm really dealing with is a man who's in a lot of fear and a lot of pain. And this particular man just broke down. He just started crying. Because us as therapists, our job is to create an environment for people to do what they need to do, to fix their work, you know, to open up. And that gave him an opening that he needed. And the only way I really knew that, that deep, that quickly, was because I experienced that. And it is hard. Uh, but we can come back better, and it's not just getting back to the level. It's transforming as human beings to be even better and stronger than we were before. And that's what I've committed myself to, is helping other men just like myself. Because if I can do it, they can do it. But there yeah. just don't seem to be a lot of people who uh, maybe have lived it or approach it in the way that I do. but. This is what works for the men I work with, and you know, uh, families are back together. It's very rewarding work. And I, there's another thing that I'm hearing uh, in this, and I'm, and I'm thinking that again, we have a lot of uh, therapists who are female, or a lot of uh, males who who aren't coming from that sort of perspective. That's why they've gone into counselling or psychotherapy. But, but I'm hearing that if you're going to work with yes. an angry man, then what you're going to get in your rooms is you're going to get some anger. Just like if you're working with someone who is That's upset right. and has a as an affective, then you're going to get tears and you're going to you're going to get uh, those sorts of problems. And you, we mustn't, as therapists, shy from that. We must not so much allow. That's them to be what angry happens. You've got, got to be careful. But yeah. And you know, Sorry, the, yeah, the Evan, you're saying that's that. what happens. That, yeah. Absolutely. And the, this is where I train other therapists. I try to help other therapists get in touch with their own anger because what's happening is that their unresolved issues uh, that have never really been addressed, not that they are have a problem with anger per se, but when someone else shows a very intense anger, it's going to press some triggers of their own fear, not a physical fear, but uh, uh, a feeling of, I shouldn't feel that, which makes them project onto their client, you know, you, you shouldn't feel that. Let me fix it. You know, well, why do you feel that? Well, what's this about? And, and the client doesn't know. That's why he's getting angry. So it, it does, I believe, take uh, the, the, the methods I use. It does take a certain personality. I mean, I remind the guys a lot of times. I say, look, you know, you know I've, I've done it too. I, you, you can't con a con is what I tell them. And uh, we understand each other. That connection, I mentioned in one of the questions, do you, do you feel misunderstood? Do you feel alone? Uh, that's a connection they've been searching for all their life. And it's been available, but they've always pushed it away because they've been taught that they don't deserve it. So it's really a, a sad process. And there's a cycle, a very specific mechanical cycle, that we can see exactly how this happens. Uh, and what I do with the guys is take them through it, educate them a little bit, and then take them 
through it uh, with a problem or with them and looking at their own parents or father or whoever was there. And it can be very powerful to see uh, that this really does have a, a method to its madness. And it can be very emotional to know that it can be fixed. It's a freedom. It's someone who, who is in a cage and has a key but has always been afraid to open it up. Yeah, I mean, it's neat. It's that sort of gestalt therapy, you know, getting them to, you know, getting yes. them to look at, the, look at their anger and uh, role play and, uh, uh, you know, and sort of, uh, you know, the theater therapy, sort of stereotype therapy. I mean, these are the sorts of things. This, this is what I love about uh, therapeutic practice is that if you just, uh, uh, you know, learn everything, but uh, learn about everything, but if you just let it go, the, the improvisations you do um, are so much more powerful. Uh, and And it's just giving it, permission uh, and giving information yes. and I think creating Good work. the idea of creating a safe place for men to express their anger in a not in a benign way I mean you certainly have to be you know make sure you know you haven't got a violent sort of right. uh, client I mean, you sure right have. right but most mostly um, tears in a safe en uh, environment uh, are very healing so some kind of of uh, expression like that. That's I, I really. That, that's my big take home from talking to you. That that if you're if you're going to get to an angry man, you have to first go through his anger. I I, I really I think that's a big message you put forward yes. there, for me anyway. The, the way I, I I sum it up is is that if you don't talk it out, you'll act it out. Because when they begin to express, which would be the talking, when when they are able to be quiet and not know everything or say, I don't know, uh, now they're not angry. They're not angry when that happens. Uh, they begin to, you know, it might just be at that moment or they finally get it together. And I point out to them, now right now when you said that, were, were you angry? No, I wasn't angry. Well, that's because you're, you're getting it out. And they know and I know and we talk about, we were taught that you don't get it out. That's not the way you do it. Uh, you take it and you use it to perform out there in the world and frankly it's worked quite well but when it comes to a relationship it won't work again and we repeat patterns over and over again uh, using uh, we have a distorted perception of what's going on uh, anger being a secondary emotion being fueled uh, by fear which is protect protecting a feeling of shame of being less than and then defense mechanisms which come in all different sorts of shapes and sizes that are, I talk about all of these in my book um, to to yeah. understand they're pretty simple but until you really see them it's hard to be objective when somebody's getting angry and I'll, I'll make one other point to mention to you it's really interesting people ask me all the time other therapists and just uh, uh, friends and colleagues well you know have you ever been attacked have do people ever you know threaten you and it's really interesting the 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 angriest and the, the worst stories, they come into my office, they sit down, I approach them in a certain way. I've had less than a handful of times that anyone's even postured over me, and mm -hmm. no one has ever tried to harm me. They've gotten heated, and I've always been able to push it back. And uh, you can't tell sitting here, but I'm not a big guy. I'm, you know, five foot seven, and... Uh, you know, I'm just a quirky kind of guy. And they don't do it because they know that there's some truth going on. And truth is a very powerful thing. So uh, it's a real different look. Yeah, I was just going to say, and the safe environment. Uh, we mustn't underestimate the power of the safe environment uh, that we create that, that enables emotions to, to not turn into uh, horrors. It's it's. Cool. Yes, yeah, so we have to be very careful. This is someone who's grown up this way, and you don't try to take away their shield. I call the anger a shield. You don't try to take it away all at once because we're sending them back out into their environment. And uh, it's important that they don't go out completely open because they wouldn't know what to do. And it, it just, you know, it's really a beautiful process when you can get someone to stick with it and see their insides and at the same time handle it the way, you know, sometimes macho guys do, you know. We don't have to necessarily sit in and say, well, what does that feel like in the kind of the traditional therapy kind of a way. It's a very active therapist position. There's a lot of laughing. Uh, there can be a lot of uh, 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 
words that she wouldn't use necessarily in public. There, you know, there, there, there's a lot of things that are different, but uh, it's a very powerful, uh, cathartic experience. Uh, the men have a paradigm shift of their view of themselves relative to the rest of the world. And as a result, that they know they're the same as everyone else, now they don't need to defend because they're not, it's not so dangerous, which means they don't have the fear, which means they don't have the anger, and they don't have to have the shame. So, you know, you can talk, you can talk shame, about it all day. <laughs> yes, the shame yeah, starts it all. Uh, you'll, you'll love this. I just saw it the other day. It's a young teenage uh, uh, chap in Australia, a young fella, and he's done a whole line of T-shirts. And uh, what, he, what he said is this thing of men not talking to each other and men <laughs> doing the tough thing. And it just is the motto is soften the bleep up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Soften up. Uh, yeah. But done in this really sort of strong macho sort of way, uh, uh, and it's really you, uh, you'd love it. I'll, I'll have to. I'm, I only just saw it the other day. I'll have to get a hold of one and send you one. You'll love it. That would be great. That would be great. Thanks. We're kind of getting uh, to the end of time. I mean, uh, okay, this, the, the Mind Times TV is you know sort of your lunchtime thing, and uh, I, I I know that we we have to do a workshop with you, a, a, a webinar, something. That I'd love can to get in and get down you know to the grid and we'd love yes. to have you um, but for now Evan um, wow you, you've got now you've got conferences that you're getting to you've got media being interested in you uh, yes in the work you do this is this is an exciting time for uh, Evan Cat. it's a real different time for someone who uh, was uh, uh, alienated and really not asked to parties and places and and I, I was a real jerk and today I walk into a room and people like me and I know that that uh, that I'm a good guy I'm not any better than anyone else the media stuff is a lot of fun but you know you keep your feet on the ground today it's not about what I do it's about who I am and the guy I see when I look in the mirror at the end of the night that's what's most important I think we talked about uh, how I was doing real well a couple years ago and I I got struck with cancer and I, uh, you know, if I had not done the work that I had been doing with my anger and understand, taking uh, responsibility for what I can fix, not for what I can't, and, and recognizing that I, I wasn't all powerful and neither was anyone else, and all the different things that uh, changed my view of myself and, and of the world and other people, had, I, had that not changed, I think I'd probably be dead. Uh, because the energy, and we know the cellular level of uh, the immune system and things that are needed to survive, particularly in the beginning stages of cancer, um, you know, they, they wouldn't have been there. It just wouldn't have been there. But on the other hand, it, it, it transformed. I said, you know, uh, the worse it gets, uh, the more I'm going to give. The more I'm going to give of myself, the more I'm going to uh, trust and have faith over fear. And I wrote the book. I said, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to write this book. I don't know what's going to happen to me, uh, but I want, uh, I want the world to know what I think. I figured if they didn't like it, you know, what's it going to do, kill me? <laughs> you know, guys, a little cancer joke there. But, uh, you know, really, you lose your fear of what people are going to think when you're in a situation. So I, I wrote the book. I'm glad that I did. And, uh, you know, it's like with therapy, and, and I'm sure you know, Richard, if, if you help one person, one family, you, you did what you were put on this earth to do. So it's very rewarding, and life's going to take me where it's going to take me. I'll never give up a little bit of my practice. Uh, but uh, this is what I do today. I, I reach out, and uh, I want to tell anyone who will listen, and uh, I, really, I really appreciate you having me. Uh, so I, well, uh, let, me, let me sort of finalize and wrap things up by saying I think you're a guy who used to be in a lot of hell, uh, but I think now you're a hell of a guy. So thanks. That's this, really neat. This is this has been a, an enormous pleasure, and uh, everybody out there, I hope, I hope you've had a, a lot. There's obviously a mile more. Uh, look up uh, uh, Evan, the, the anger guy. Oh, what's your website, uh, Evan? Uh, it's www.theangerguy. T H E A N G E R G U Y dot com. Not the angry guy. The anger guy, because I've changed today. <laughs> yes. So everyone, go in and check that out, 
and uh, uh, we'll have a link to that on our site. And, uh, and actually, uh, for all those people who've come into to Evan's site and are, are watching this interview um, from from his perspective, hello to you. And this this is great. I after every after every interview, I have to go off and sit down and have a real big think. Evan, for now I've though, enjoyed it we have tremendously. To say Okay. Thanks so again bye -bye for having me. Well in Georgia. Okay. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Richard. Take care.